Hello. Welcome. Welcome. Hello, 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 and welcome to Zero Today. I am your humble host, Dr. Lorenzo Neal, hailing from Cajun Land, USA, here to present you with seeds of wisdom, insight, empowerment, and liberation. We are promoting a knowledge that is engaging and transforming, and we are here to empower you, our listeners, to knowing and impacting the world around us. And as always, you're welcome to join us on this illuminating journey. Uh, this is being broadcast live on blog talk radio as well as live on the dr lorenzo neal facebook page so um we appreciate it and those who are watching later uh the, on youtube we appreciate you for watching also and you can have all the all the information will be posted in the description we invite you to if you're watching by way of youtube to like this video share this video uh, subscribe to this channel as well as uh, hit that bell for notifications when we upload future videos. Um, like you, I'm, I'm I'm practicing my quarantine or uh, self uh, shelter in place order, and um, I'm 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 managing. <laughs> I am trying to keep myself occupied, always trying to do find new ways to do things and I wish I could do physical ministry and it's it's really difficult not being able to do physical ministry and I want to applaud the uh these organizations and ministries that are doing as much as they can here uh here in the metro area there are several ministries that are doing a lot uh assisting and providing food lunches and in some cases even shelter um they have resources to do that, uh, and we're, uh, we're we're just trying to do what we can, and I'm trying to do as much as I can personally by supporting those organizations that are doing that and promoting what they are doing. And so we're grateful to that. I uh, hope all of you who are listening are, are being safe, that you are practicing the guidelines that have been presented to us, and um, that you are looking after yourself as well as those who um, are part of vulnerable populations of, of which I am a part I'm one of those vulnerable persons so I'm doing as much as I can to be as proactive as I can um, to uh, s uh, curb the spread so that uh, of this and I'm, I'm grateful for all of the, those of you who are doing it and we do ask that you pray for those families who lost one of ones myself uh, we've lost two members of our congregation um, uncertain if it was COVID related but they did pass and um, they did have underlying health issues and you know death whether it's natural whether it's traumatic when whatever in this time height seems to heighten the sense of of grief and so uh we do want to provide words of comfort and hope that you can provide words of comfort to those who are experiencing that grief in this moment in these days um there's so much going on i, I wanted to talk about and this is kind of it's going to kind of come across as a bit random and uh it, it's not that i'm not not organized. I don't have a thought. Um, we're gonna get to the to, to the topic of the day, which is uh, the church versus the First Amendment, or the church and the First Amendment, and um, how churches are, uh, or, or church leaders in some cases, and pastors, in more particular, uh, are using the First Amendment argument as a way to defy. Uh, ordinances from the local state and um, federal officials and um, it, it's grieving it, it really is grieving um, there's an article that I just read and you can go to the old black church um, for this Ms. Ann Brock posted this and it's a story she lists 12 uh, um, bishops of the Church of God in Christ who have succumbed to uh, the COVID virus and um, it is really sad that it's, it's said that many of them may have contacted it contracted it at a funeral in Detroit 
we learned that uh, he won his um wide yeah Marvin is past Marvin. Uh, uh, their mother and I think his BB one is another relative all tested positive for the COVID and um when the news broke of Marvin Winans testing of course he he came out and said he didn't but later recanted that and said that he had posted tested positive. And it, it's a sad thing, you know statistically uh within the American we have the highest uh rate right now per capita we have the highest rate of persons infected and persons who have succumbed from the disease and you know the media broke this loose and they're trying to say that it's because of health disparities and all of that and uh, I was on a I was on the town hall call the other evening with uh uh, leaders from the NAACP, Yellen Van Zant, and many other persons, and this is one of the things that came up, and uh, I, I agree because I, I know this is a reality for many of us black folk. We don't trust hospitals, especially as black men. Uh, you know, I know it's a stereotype, but it's 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 real. We don't trust doctors. We try to, we we have more faith in our home remedies. <laughs> Than in, in 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 medicine, and there's nothing wrong with that because I can tell you as, as a fact that um, that home remedies have done a whole lot of healing for me in, in my body. You know, making a hot toddy every now and then to get a cold. And matter of factly, I believe I may have I may have had this virus and um, came through on the other side because I had anyway. I, I I believe I had it. I, I I can't verify that. I'm just going by based on what they said the symptoms were, um, and about the time that it began to spread in mid to late uh, February and early March, I had been traveling and and more than likely came in contact with someone who was infected with the virus, and I displayed the symbols the symptoms of that. Uh, but I I did what I usually do when I get the flu. Um, I you know I use it's usually over the counter medicines a whole lot of rest and um, I, I I basically followed through you know with a home remedy and if it did have the virus that was sufficient and there are a lot of persons and I have an underlying health issue pre-existing condition I'm a type one diabetic and um, it seemed to have worked if I did have it if not it was just another you know uh seasonal cold or flu but but we we don't trust medical officials you know if you watch the story of the Clark sisters uh the song the, the mini series uh, the the movie on lifetime you saw where Dr. Mighty Maddie Moss Clark had that underlying issue and she clung on to the belief that God will heal her in spite of her illness and and you know she died from her illnesses, but she had an overwhelming faith that you know God would heal her, and God did heal her by by uh, granting her rest. So if you look at it from that perspective, yes. But it, it, we didn't we don't take a lot of stuff serious. You know, I I have a lot of persons that I know who are type two diabetics, as they're diagnosed later in life, and they're like, well, we gotta die of something. <laughs> So we go die from diabetes. Well, let it be. You know, um, so we just don't take it as serious as we could and as we should, which unfortunately we have seen become very damaging to us. And um, we got to do better. We we must do better. We will do better. And I believe we are doing better. Uh, because this may be putting the fear of God in some of us. I, I hope it is, because um, if if not, uh, we we we're in, you know, we're going to continue to see this spread in our communities and not be able to do anything. And that's a dangerous thing. That is a dangerous thing. But um, the other thing that really gets me 
regarding this um, pandemic is the, is the fact that we're we're finding this this new paradigm of of ministry, of worship, and we're it's really uncomfortable. And I can tell you from my own personal experience, it's very uncomfortable not being able to have members physically assemble and be able to engage in worship, in corporate worship together. You know, it's not the same as you're having a Zoom meeting or a live stream and you're seeing come, uh, people coming in. You can't even really see the comments, if, especially if you're really engaged in the message. You, you ain't paying attention to comments. So you can't hear if somebody say, hey, man, because <laughs> if you start reading, you get distracted. And you just got to keep going and you're in the moment. And, you know, it, it, some, some, this is a test uh, of a lot of people's preaching. <laughs> because they don't have the, the organ. They don't have the drum. You know, they don't have the piano. They don't have all that fancy stuff to back them up. Wait, wait, I take that back. There is an app. <laughs> there, there's a, there's a, a hooping app. Uh, well, I don't know if it's who, but it's, it's just this little app where you can, you know, they have the chorus program, the shouting chorus, the back preacher backing chorus, all that, and you just, okay, I know I sound horrible, <laughs> but uh, so they do have those chords that that app available. So I, I wonder if a lot of people are using that doing those services. It, uh, you know, they they say. Can you hear me? And they hit that button. Bah! <laughs> I'm laughing, but, but it's funny because it's true. But it's really, it's really changing the dynamic of the entirety of how we do ministry and how we, as preachers, proclaim the gospel message. Now, you know, just to think about it, 60 to 70 years ago, this medium uh, was only available. And when I mean this medium, I'm talking about the medium of radio and the medium of television was not readily accessible to a lot of people. So a lot of ministries didn't do it. And the ones who did do it, you know, they 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 budgeted for it and they expanded later on into television broadcasting. But for the most part, uh, the streaming has been available. Uh, so even the local church could do like a radio broadcast on the local radio station or uh, a television broadcast on the local television station but for the most part they had an audience and with the streaming thing you know you have an audience you just don't know how big the audience is in some cases you know like those of us who's using Facebook you know you, you may be able to see you have so many people watching but they're watching and then they're tuning out and it doesn't give you a a, a, a great assessment or analysis of what's really what the really what the audience is really doing and some like I've done you know you tune in and then you're not really paying attention because it may be on your browser on your laptop or your uh, your app or your phone and you get interruptions and you get distractions or you're just doing something to kind of busy yourself and that it is what it is it's a new paradigm and we're going to be adjusting to this because it's not going away anytime soon. This is going to be for uh, a long term. By long term, you know, I'm talking seven, several months into this year. We may still be using this medium. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to assemble soon. But if not, we need to be prepared to, to do this. But going back to the point I was making regarding those preachers. You know, who use the razzmatazz, the dazzle, and to, you know, to engage the audience because their their preaching skills were really weak to begin with. And so, you know, they relied on crowd engagement. And I look, that's those those are the kind of preachers that come out yelling and say, come on, give God to me. I, I know I sound ridiculous, but. If you've been to some churches like that, you know what I'm talking about. They start out loud. They keep getting loud. They really don't say much of anything. But the crowd seems to be engaged because they've tapped into that 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 
that plane where it's on the verge of emotional and spiritual and yeah, I don't know. So it's really testing them because they don't have any <laughs> anything to to uh, counter that. But that's neither that's here nor there. I just I'll just be prayerful for the church, for the people. Now speaking back, because this is just going to be a short broadcast. It's not going to be a full hour. Um, may not even be a full thirty minutes. I I don't really know right now. <laughs> I'm just just kind of going as I go. Um, and I lost my train of thought just that quick. Oh yeah, getting back to the topic that we are discussing, and and uh, the church and the First Amendment right to assemble. So, the, here's the thing: the founding fathers, though many of them were were religious, they weren't uh, they weren't evangelical. As we would describe them today, many of them were really just deists. They they understood the idea of God because they were in the age of the Enlightenment, and reason was their guiding principle. There was that reason was their guiding spirit, um, and and that birthed within them the sense of independence, both individual and uh, collectively as a country. And so they put within the founding document, the Constitution. The, the ability for religious freedom to be expressed. So they didn't make a state church. And that's what that means. You know, the First Amendment when it talks about religious freedom. The United States does not have a state religion. So it endorses the ability for everyone who is part, who is a citizen of this country. To have their own religious belief system. And that includes everything that we can think of, even what we don't agree with. They put it in there as a means of encouraging every American to be faithful to his or her deity and religious practices. And although there are some on the Christian right, and, and, and I too myself um, believe that many of them were Christian and integrated Christian idealism into uh, the founding documents. Particularly, uh, um, what's the third president? <laughs> Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> Jefferson and his, as he wrote the Declaration of Independence. And uh, Madison as they collaborated together on the, um, the, uh, the Constitution. As they, as they put their minds together, they were thinking there are people who, you know, we have churches here that are expressing and articulating what we as a nation really believe should be foundational for human growth and development and that was that they promoted this idea of the creator you know and without forcing a state religion they enabled um, several faith groups to prosper so that no one would dominate the other and we're in an age now where that seems to be dissolving as uh, one faith group is attempting to dominate all other faith groups, and it's sad that they're doing that. And I'm a part of that faith group, unfortunately. You know, uh, what we consider as evangelical Christians, many persons who profess being born again are uh, are within that group. But then you have the extremists within that group who, would, if they could have themselves, have it their way, uh, we would be a. Uh, Somewhat of a theocracy where God would rule everything, but it would be their explicit version of of what God is to them. And in uh, in a Christian, in evangelical Christian, uh, it's called the New Apostolic Reformation uh, or Dominion uh, theology, and uh, whatever else you can call it. It's, it's of several names that it's called, but it basically idea that. Um, Believers function under the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, and it is our responsibility to bring God into the secular uh, world. So we are to let our light shine, right? And by letting our light shine, we are promoting the kingdom of God because we pray as Jesus taught, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, in earth, as it is in heaven, right? 
and many interpreted that to say that we should be dominating Christians should be dominating the sphere of the secular world there shouldn't be a secular world to begin with as some Christ American Christians would say in particular that uh, America is a Christian country so there is no no way around that and um, there's truth to that and not gonna knock that but the First Amendment if you're very familiar with the First Amendment it gives everyone the right to freely religious free religious expression and so now there are uh, churches who are challenging it and they're challenging uh, these state local and federal uh, ordinances to not gather now let me just put it personally to you uh, to me I completely understand the desire to keep going keep church going and I said that as I opened it I completely understand I wish I could but I understand Particularly for those that I shepherd, under shepherd, they're vulnerable. I'm vulnerable. I put myself at risk if anyone comes into the church that may be asymptomatic. We don't know. There are a lot of persons who, are, who have succumbed from this who were asymptomatic. There are a lot of persons who have recovered from this that were asymptomatic. Matter of fact, uh, still the statistics still say between 75 and 80 percent of individuals who can uh, contract this virus will survive it and will you know recover from it after so many days. You know, some may take a few days, some may take a week, some may take a few weeks, but they recover and they self quarantine. I have a pastor friend right now who is in recovery from. Uh, from the virus he's doing well and we uh, continue to pray for him and his family but there was also a pastor friend in the same community who succumbed from it so and both of them are healthy but their churches and uh, leaders or uh, Christian leaders in particular who are defying this they're defying this order and so uh, really our Three churches, as I know of right now, are suing the state of California. Uh, they filed a, so a lawsuit against the, uh, Governor Newsom of California and local officials over the state's stay-at-home order, which they say violates their freedom of religious practice. So, uh, and uh, and let me put this in perspective: the church, the the government is not. Asking well, let me let me put this. In. Uh, the government is not saying all churches are to cease operations. They're not saying that at all, and that would de definitely be a violation. But what they are saying is to to um, be as proactive as you can. Don't assemble in groups of ten or more. And uh, I've seen plenty of uh, services where. They are. They have the musicians. They have a little, little uh, group there to sing, and preacher, and whoever's filming, and they still have that environment of church. They still have that sense of of worship, but with limited personnel. So, um, the the thing about it is that this idea of religious liberty. And freedom first began challenged in the uh, latter part of 2010s, and when you had a lot of these state as really after um, the gay marriage, a uh, gay uh, a same-sex marriage was approved by the uh, U.S. Supreme Court was recognized. A lot of states in the South and some in the North rolled out. Um, these laws they were not supposed to be non-discriminatory but allowed re uh, religious freedom exemptions exemptions for businesses in essence saying if a person if a business uh, did not want to do business 
with <laughs> customers who they perceived to be same sex. They didn't have to. And for many, that they said that was not a violation of the Constitution, but the others were saying it was a violation of the Constitution, and regardless regarding religious liberty. The freedom from religion uh, or uh, foundation or, and on his website, <laughs> I, I, Jack, I, I, I like it because it's funny. It says, practice social distancing between church and state. And they have a picture of uh, the, the church and a Capitol building. <laughs> it's just funny. And what they're saying, what they're promoting is that no governor uh, should exempt churches or religious organizations from the social distancing ordinances or shelter in place ordinances uh, even though there were some I, I think uh the santas out of florida um is was one i know made the news saying that uh, religious organizations and churches were exempt and the freedom from religion uh foundation was basically saying look if you're going, if you if you if you're not going to exempt universities, if you're not going to exempt um, uh, all uh, sporting events, if you're not going to exempt any other thing where people gather gather in larger crowds, you should not exempt churches, the, because the only reason you're exempting them is for a religious purpose. And if you're in the South, athletics is just as religious <laughs> as the church. And I lie to you not because people are just uh, as uh, uh, worshiping in that moment of their sporting, especially you in the SEC, man. That is religion all of itself. <laughs> and yeah, so that was they were saying, you know, use this opportunity to make sure that there are no exemptions for the churches. But in California, those churches are, are, are saying no. We should be exempt because it is a First Amendment thing. And the First Amendment grants us the power to, uh, to gather and assemble. And you as the state, in this case California, not the federal, but California, you don't have the means to do that. It was also reported Mayor Bill de Blasio was threatening to close all churches um to as as a way of halting the the virus or curving the spread of the virus but it um uh, also mayor cuomo uh governor cuomo in his one of his most recent press conferences and i had to the clip he said god didn't stop this and he was saying in regard to uh how these social distancing and other things that they have place have in place uh were beneficial and and leading to um the fact that these this uh this virus has even though they lead new york city leads in the total number of deaths and um i believe also in the number of cases in the country i could be mistaken but certainly the number of deaths in new orleans and uh st john parish is not far behind hey, hey Demetrius, how you doing brother um so they're not far behind but uh these these persons newsome and uh de blasio cuomo are are really you know, they are, they're not Believers, you know, I, I don't believe they have a real religious identity. Um, they're politicians, definitely. So they're 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 looking to populism as a way of, you know, saying, okay, I'm going to do what I believe is in the best interest of the people because I want to be reelected. Doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work, but that's what they're saying and that's what they're doing. And it came across as a threat to those churches there in New York when the mayor said we might have to just close ch churches by force. Now, if he would have done that, that would have been a violation of the First Amendment because the state does not have the authority to do so. Now, let me counter that by saying that the state does sanction the church. By sanction, I mean that you can't have an organized church without first getting it 
organized recognized by the state by way of you know domestic articles of incorporation and by way of the federal government recognizing your um, tax exempt status as 501c3 corporation so in that sense the state does sanction the operation of the church but does not sanction the function and existence of the church and what these persons are arguing particularly these churches who are suing California saying the state is infringing on both the function and operation of the church and it's a very thin line because you know when we say the, the right to assemble that's what they're using not they're not using the religious freedom argument they're using the right to assemble argument which in some ways is a valid argument because the state can uh, break up protests they have the authority to do that and in that construct if the church violates a state order and they gather the state then does have the authority to exert whatever in, uh, authority it has to cancel out that uh, you know to cause that to cease and I hope it's never by force but they do have the authority to invoke local authorities for example uh, you know, uh, if they follow the change of the man, command, uh, the the local leadership would say, "Look, this is a law. We, this is an ordinance that we think is in the best interest of our community, our city, and the health and wellness of all our beings. By violating this, you're putting the wealth, the health, and welfare of your fellow brothers and sisters and community members at jeopardy." You're not looking at the broader perspective. You're just looking at the fact that you want to have church. And that is short-sighted. But in the broader sense, we're seeing where there's this intellectual battle between the secular and the, uh, the religious. That's been going on for um, centuries, really. The... Uh, Ever since the beginning of the Age of Enlightenment, and, and the late beginning, really in the late 15th century, no, the late, I say the late 16th century, the early 1500s, the late 1500s, on into the 20th century, there's been this, this, this there's been this wrestling match between religion and the state uh, or secularism, and America walks a very fine line, very fine line. In this because while we allow for religious freedom and expression we also <laughs> don't allow for full religious uh, freedom and expression because there's some things that are taboo we like you know we don't allow for uh, <laughs> human sacrifice <laughs> even though some people may include human sacrifice as part of their religious expression I hope that's not the case but we see, even if even if you do observe that, that is a violation. Uh, you know, that's murder. But I, I, that's an extreme example, y'all. I'm not. Uh, that is an extreme example. But we walk a very fine line. And then when it comes to the American church, particularly the uh, evangelical Christian church, the fine the line is even finer because it then defines who should be able to worship and how that worship should uh should look and that that's where the that's where it really draws the line because when they when they're arguing this freedom to assemble they are allow, uh, they're allowing uh, allying themselves with other things that they probably wouldn't usually agree with so if they're saying you the state is telling us not to assemble because of our religious perspective or our religious practice then they have to join forces with the Wiccans they have to join forces with the atheists they have to join forces with all these other uh, usually non recognized groups in American religious uh, the spectrum of American religious praxis and I know they don't want to do that I know they don't want to do that uh, and it's the same same way with those, you know, they they may be protesting against. And so it's a very, very fine, fine line. 
but I'm 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 gonna go with the um I, I I'm gonna go with the state on this. Um when it comes to essential critical workers and, and as much as I wanna thank myself to be one, uh I'm not a critical essential worship wor uh, worker. You know, my job as a pastor is is full, is bountiful, it covers a whole lot. Uh my job is is respectful and all of that. But it it's essential in the sense that I still have to provide some sense of spiritual care. And but it's not essential in that that those persons have to come to the physical building to receive that fit that spiritual care. That's the beauty of ministry, and I'm learning that. And I know a lot of pastors are learning that. You know that that not being in those four walls is just as beneficial as being in those four walls because we can provide more transparency for one. For two, we can let the others we serve and we serve with see that we're vulnerable to the same things that they're vulnerable. Because as long as we're in that pulpit, a lot of people would think that we're immune to a lot of the things of the world. And so when we have incidents that <laughs> come from the world, like sickness, like um, moral failings or anything like that, then we're seen as being weak and fraudulent in some cases. And, and that really isn't the case. It really isn't the truth. So this provides an opportunity for us to show that we are all in this together. There's we're all vulnerable to this, and that we uh, are still able to carry out essential ministry and shepherding to those who are in need, just as are we in the same state. And I think that's the most powerful thing as pastors we can do. Instead of just saying we need to have physical church. No, we don't need to have physical church. We just need to make sure that those who are part of the church are still being ministered to. And we turn them to the Christ of the church. That's that's the critical thing. That they turn inward and not outward. And I know for a lot of persons, especially preachers, this is the coping mechanism. You know, church is a coping mechanism. So when we gather, we're able to, you know, if we're if some preachers are codependent, that's what they need. They have that need to be needed. I got to preach. They got to hear me preach. You know, I'm really going off <laughs> on a tangent. But that, that's just, just reality of what it is and how it is. And how do we counter this? That's the the question how do we counter it how do we how do we find a balance in the practice of sheltering in place social distancing in ministry we the way we counter it is by being faithful to the god who collectively called us to not forsake the assembly of ourselves together so we can still assemble together uh you know the virtual means is doing so. There, there are a lot of virtual churches that had, were uh, popping up long before this this uh, pandemic forced uh, mainline churches like myself, uh, mine, to to come <laughs> come come into that sphere. You know, I I did it screaming and kicking like a lot of people. You know, I'm well, I'm, I'm joking. I didn't. We already were beginning to set, you know, we were anticipating the need to be able to do so. And so we, we were we were being strategic in that. And so good thing for some um, forward thinking individuals in my congregation were able to see this need before we even were forced to do it. So I just pray for these pastors who who want to I understand the need to want to have church and I understand you know this this season where we think we have to make it happen but you got to understand you know uh preventing large gatherings at this moment is even more crucial and I'm I'm reading this from uh a uh an article on the Christian Post regarding uh Governor DeSantis and his exemption for uh 
I don't know if it's been revised. If you're in Florida area, you can tell me if it's been revised or not. But it's not a ban any more than it is a ban, you know, than having speed limits. You know, you have your stop sign. A stop sign doesn't tell you you can't drive anymore. It just simply means when you come to this place, you stop. Make sure that the path is clear before you proceed forward. And so I, this is how I view uh, these these ordinances uh, given by uh, our, our leadership, our local, state, and federal legal sh leadership. It's not it's not a ban. They're not telling us we cannot do church at all anymore. They're simply saying that look, take this mo excuse me, take this moment to stop. And here's my my other counter argument to these churches that are are, are using this uh, this argument, the First Amendment argument. You gotta understand for centuries that that argument has been used in favor of churches, and has um. Because it's been used in favor of churches, it has gone against a lot of these organizations that deserve the same rights, have the same rights, and have been neglected. So, you know, again, the United States is, does not have a state church, does not mandate that everybody who comes to America become a Christian or anything like that or go to church. It doesn't mandate that. So we have to stop thinking like that. It does not favor any religious belief over another. And we should use this moment. If we are if we are carry for, if the church is a hospital for the soul. Well, in this case, the hospital is not at the best use when and maybe this is not the best analogy, but you know, if 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 we cannot provide adequate care in this moment, we should let those who can do so do so, and we should do all we can. And and I know it may sound like a uh, a fraudulent argument or a fallacy. I may have uh, uh, used I may have used a fallacy, a fallacious argument there, uh, uh, and it was not intentional. But you guys get to understand what I'm saying. Anyway, I I didn't mean to uh, ramble on like this. I, I do. Hope that in this time that we can, we can uh, learn together, we can grow together, and come out of this stronger than we were uh, before. Anyway, thank you so much, you guys, for tuning in. I want to invite you to support us on all our uh, social media. We're on the Facebook page, uh, Facebook, the uh, Pastor Lorenzo Neal Zero Facebook page. Also, uh, you're watching this live by way of Dr. Lorenzo Neal. Follow us on our social media. We're on Twitter. Show handle is at Zera Radio, at Z E R A Radio. My personal handle is at Lorenzo T Neal. We're also we're also uh on all other social media wherever that is. We invite you to uh to join us there, and we want you to support us. We become a patron for as little as a dollar a month. You can support uh this program and what we're doing. And that's simply going to patreon.com slash Lorenzo T. Neal for as little as a dollar a month. You can support it. This radio show is sponsored by Skillshare. Right now, you can, um, if, if you go to Skillshare, you can have two free months of premium. Uh, and you can learn a whole, little, whole new skill. And um, you'll be helping this channel, be helping this show, be helping everything. So we just really appreciate that. As we get out of here, you guys have a wonderful day. Whatever you do today, make it a great day because the Lord has blessed you to do so. Uh, all right. Dr. Neil is out.